Yvonne Chouinard had the, I think, perfect definition for adventure. He said, adventure, adventure only starts when things start going wrong. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a story about something where things went very wrong. I was with my good friend, Malcolm Daly, who started Trango, the uh, climbing equipment company. And Malcolm was a very good climber, but he never climbed in Alaska. And I had climbed there a lot. So I, we decided to go and try and do a new route on a mountain, Thunder Mountain, which was right next to uh, Mount Hunter. We got in there and uh, we looked at this line and it was beautiful, it was about 3,000 vertical feet. This is a very remote area, by the way. And our pilot was a good friend of mine, a bush pilot, and uh, Paul Roderick, and he landed us there. And every day he would come by and check on us. He'd fly by and we didn't have good enough weather to climb for a while. And you could see Paul fly by and wave his wings and then take off because we were way away from anything else. So we got up and made an attempt one time and got up to the uh, crux area of five pitches of really steep ice climbing just as the bad weather came in, went back down. And a few days later, we went back up and we went for it. Now it's Alaska. And so the, it never really gets dark in the summertime. So we decided to go for this in one big push and not bring any bivouac gear and go really light and fast. So we get up to that point that we had been to, to before, uh, some mixed climbing and uh, to get there, but not as hard as, and all of a sudden we see five pitches of really steep ice climbing. And I remember Malcolm said, oh man, this is cool. Beautiful ice, beautiful rock. I love it. I love Alaska. And we started climbing and it was, you know, water ice five and pretty hard climbing and we we're making good progress. The weather was perfect. And then all of a sudden we heard a plane and we looked down and 2,000 feet below us, we could see this plane going along the glacier and it was Paul he was making his uh, daily trip to see us. And he kept flying, he couldn't see us, we were above him. And we got to what would have been the last pitch. And above this pitch, it was going to be five or 600 feet to the summit, but low angle, moderate angle snow climbing. So we're in the last technical pitch. And it was Malcolm's time uh, to pitch the lead. So I got into a semi-hanging belay. I put a couple ice screws in and I'm chopped out a little stance and I'm belaying. And Malcolm went out to the right and did a 60 foot vertical ice wall, put a couple, two or three screws in and got up to a ledge system and then started traversing back above me. Now I couldn't see him at that time and I couldn't hear him, but I could knew he was traversing above me because stuff started coming down, little pieces of snow and ice. And, and uh, it, it took a long time and I'm sitting and not knowing what's going on. And after what seemed like an interminable amount of time, I heard a yell. Now Malcolm had two ropes, the lead rope and a haul line. And I look up and I see the lead rope and the haul line both going like this, coming down to me. And all of a sudden, snow and ice coming down. And then the next thing I see is Malcolm, right above me, 50 feet above me, hurtling towards me. And uh, I ducked like this. I had a full one-piece uh, Gore-Tex suit on. And I ducked like that. And he, he hit me as he came flying by. And I was bent over and all this debris was coming down, ice and snow, and then I felt the rope come tight, and I realized that I held his fall. I had the uh, rope going up through uh, directional, but I was nauseous, and I couldn't understand why I was nauseous. I was bent over, and I was, I, I, I tried really hard to keep from getting sick, and I, over, I overcame the nauseousness, nauseousness. And I, I straightened up and I looked down and I had this uh, yellow Gore-Tex suit on and it was all, there was a lot of blood on my right side. And I could see that um, he had front pointed me in my thigh with his monopoint crampon as he had gone by. And then I looked down and I saw Malcolm hanging below me on, the, uh, on 70 degree ice, slumped over. And I thought he was dead. He had fallen almost 200 feet. And I yelled down, Malcolm, no answer. I'm 2,500 feet above the glacier in a very remote area. And I'm thinking, what to do now? I, I think he's dead. I, what's the next step? 
And then all of a sudden I hear Malcolm say, did I fall? <laughs> he had woken up, he had been momentarily unconscious. And I uh, yelled down, yes. And he said, was I leading? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, and he, 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 Malcolm checked himself out and he said, well, I think I have a couple broken legs. And I said, and then I noticed that the rope hanging down to Malcolm was cut halfway through. And I didn't know how badly it was. I said, Malcolm, you're going to have to chop out a stance, put an ice screw in and tie yourself to it as soon as you can, <laughs> which he did. It took him a while. He tied himself to it. Then he untied the rope and I pulled it up to me and it was cut halfway through. And so now I can't use that rope. But I have a haul line, you know, an accessory line, a haul line. So I rappel down to Malcolm. He was about 70 feet below me. And by the time I get to Malcolm, Malcolm said, okay, well, I have a, a compound fib tib on my left leg. You can see the two bones sticking out. And he said, I think I shattered my, my right foot and I have a broken finger, but that doesn't count. <laughs> So, okay, well, and then we, so I took the ice axes and I uh, uh, splinted his legs as best I could. But from there, it was about five or six feet of uh, low angle ice, and then it dropped off to a ledge about uh, 150 feet below, and I knew that ledge was there. So we're 2,500 feet above the glacier, no one else around. So I figured, well, I have to get Malcolm down. And I started lowering him, and uh, he was screaming in pain, even with the splints, it wasn't enough. But once he got into space, he was fine. So I was able to lower him down to this ledge. And then I rappelled down to him, and now we, we had more broken terrain to get down, and I tried to lower him, it was just not gonna happen. It was just too painful with all the broken bones. And, and in fact, the doctor said later that uh, it would have killed him. If I, you know, if he could have put up with the pain and lowered that far. So I had no choice but to leave him and chopped out a ledge. We had no bivouac gear because we were doing it in one push. But I gave my extra clothing and food and stuffed his feet into a pack and left him there, tied him in. And then I started down. But now I only have one rope because the other rope had been cut halfway through. So I started rappelling down and uh, I got down to about a thousand vertical feet above the glacier and uh, no more gear. <laughs> and it was about a 60 degree uh, ice slope for a thousand feet. Now 60 degrees, if you're a, an expert climber and you have good gear, is not so, that, that terribly steep, but it's Alaskan ice, which is ancient ice. It's not ice that formed over the winter is gonna melt and go away. So it's brittle, hard ice. So it's very hard to, get penetration with your front points and your tools. So it's harder to climb. So I had a down climb, a thousand feet of it, unroped. And, uh, and I had, by this time, where the front point had gone into my thigh, I had this huge hematoma swelling. And so every few steps, my, my, right, my right leg would just give. And oh, okay. But I was bound and determined to get down this damn thing, and I did. <laughs> I got to the bottom. Now at this point, Malcolm's up there, and but he couldn't see me, and he's waiting and waiting several hours, and and he's thinking, oh my God, you know, Jim probably didn't make it down, and I'm going to die up here. And then all of a sudden, he saw me go out, walk out onto the glacier, and he his hopes got a little bit better. Now when I got to the bottom, our our tent, we had a, a big North Face dome tent, fully stocked with lots of good stuff and it was about a quarter of a mile out in the glacier and I didn't know if I, I was exhausted and but I saw that the sun was setting and the, the, the tent I was in the shade and the tent was in the sun and I saw the shade line was moving towards the tent so I made a game for myself the game was I was going to beat the uh, shade line to the tent and I did just barely and I got to the tent and I immediately uh, it was by down I was about seven or eight o'clock at night and um, very day, it was still a lot of daylight because it was Alaska. But I saw some clouds coming in from the south southwest. And I thought, oh no, 
It's a storm coming. I've climbed in Alaska many, many times. And it looked like a storm from the southwest. It usually lasts three or four days. So I thought, okay, Paul Roderick has already checked for us. It's late at night. He's not coming back. I'll go in, I'll get in the tent, I'll have all this wonderful food and everything, and I, okay, I've got this hematoma, but that's not a big deal. And it'll, it'll be storming for three or four days, and the, the, nobody will be flying. No planes will fly. And then Malcolm will be dying up there on that ledge. He has no sleeping bag, you know. And I'll be down here comfortable. And I was feeling very, dep- I had gotten inside the tent, I had taken off my one-piece Gore-Tex suit, and uh, now it's having these bad thoughts. And then I heard an engine, a plane engine, you know, that you can really hear. And I got out, I saw a plane coming in and I took my suit and I'm waving it around in the air. It was Paul Roderick. And he said if from two miles away, he could see me waving this and he knew something was wrong. So he came in and landed. This was about nine o'clock at night or in the evening and picked me up and flew me out to Talkeetna. Now, he'd always have checked us once a day. and uh, But this particular day, he had just dropped his last trip off at Kehotna Base, which is where people go to do the regular route on Denali. And he was flying back. Now, normally he'd fly straight back to Talkeetna. To get to where we were, he had to take a side trip like this. So you more air miles. And uh, so he's getting to, getting to that point where if he wants to see us, he has to make the left-hand turn instead of going straight. And he's thinking, you know, well, you know, I was by there today, th- things are okay. But at the last minute he had a premonition and he made that left-hand turn and saw me. And so they brought me to the ranger station and the medic is working on me while I'm, I'm telling him what happened. I remember uh, this. <laughs> This medic had a syringe full of ster- sterile water. He's cleaning out my my puncture wound, and he was squirting it in. It would go all the way in and come out like a little fountain. He goes, "Hey, look at that! Look at that! It's pretty neat." <laughs> <laughs> and so I tell him what happens, and then and, and what happened after that is they had a helicopter go in and to our base camp. I couldn't help but they rescue him because of my injury, and the storm did come in, but it wasn't a hugely bad one, but it was bad enough. And so Malcolm spent two nights up there and they finally got him off right before the major storm came in after 44 hours on that ledge. And a helicopter pilot was able to maneuver in and a guy from a 200 foot rope was hanging from the helicopter and he maneuvered in. The guy climbs up to Malcolm with ice tools and Malcolm's first words to him were, Hey, cool, you have Trango tools. <laughs> and they pulled them off. And uh, by this time, Malcolm's wife had gotten into town, Karen. And we heard that they had just pulled them off. And they were going to stop in at the airport in Talkeetna to refuel the helicopter before they flew to Anchorage. And so we rushed over and we got there just as the helicopter was landing. And there's Malcolm in the helicopter. He's, he's spent 44 hours up there, two nights, freezing his butt off. And it turned out that he was slowly bleeding at the time, and he almost bled to death before they got him. But he didn't know that at the time. And so we there, and, and Malcolm, now there's two types of people. One type where their glass is always half empty, and the other type where their glass is always half full. Malcolm is the epitome of the glass half full guy. He's always sees the positive side of everything. I said, Malcolm, what was it like up there? He goes, well, you know, the first night, uh, he said, you know, the only thing is my shoulders are really sore. And I go, your shoulders are really sore. And he goes, yeah, I I was just doing all these windmills to stay warm and my shoulders are really sore. I said, everything else okay? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, said, this first night there was spin drift avalanches coming down every few minutes and they cover me up and I had to, you know, brushed the snow away. And I said, that must have been horrible. Uh, he said, no, nah, gave me something to do. <laughs> so anyway, they flew him and he spent time in the hospital in Anchorage and then they flew him back to the States. And indeed, he had crushed his talus bone and he had the fib tib. They set that. He had some frostbite. So the first thing they did is amputated one of his big toes of his right foot. And Neptune Mountaineering, a store, a famous store in um, 
in Boulder uh, has a like a climbing museum in with the all the merchandise. And in that museum right now, there's a, a, a jar of formaldehyde with Malcolm Malcolm's toe in it. <laughs> and uh, for a year, he tried to make his right foot work. It, but it, the bones had been shattered in his ankle, and there's very little blood supply. So eventually, he, he made the elective, uh, he had elective surgery, and he had his right foot removed. They were able to uh, amputate below his knee. And so, you know, which is a lot better than amputating above your knee. And when he uh, amputated, he, he tried to get the foot, so he wanted to put that in formaldehyde too, but they wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> But the uh, upside of all this, Malcolm, uh, after this accident, with a, a, an Iraqi veteran, a captain who had, that was a climber and had been badly injured in Iraq, they started what's called Paradox Sports, which is well known now. And Paradox Sports, what they do is they take, bring people who have lost limbs and they take them ice climbing, fly fishing in Alaska. They do all sorts of wonderful things for them. And uh, Malcolm, as an amputee, ended up starting that. And so it, it had a silver lining. That's my story. <laughs>